good afternoon i extend a very warm welcome to all those who are present today uh, both online and in the seminar hall with us for this uh, lecture by one of our fellows dr amit kumar which focuses on india's uh, indian ocean past and its strategy for the future now he has submitted an abstract i can see that one of the main objectives of his talk is to underline how india played a very very important role in the maritime tradition of the indian ocean and of asia and the world now i must say at the very outset that this is something on which a lot of work has been done in the 20th century by historians diplomats and uh, some economic historians also now we are familiar with the works of i think the lead in this was taken by the great diplomat uh, k m panikkar uh when in 1945 he wrote uh, his famous book uh, india and the indian ocean which talked about the maritime traditions of india in this region then in 1953 he wrote uh, a much more famous book uh, asia and the western dominance which is remembered to this day which uh, in some ways covered this subject and then of course uh, the works of some of the uh, foreign historians like fernand rodel mn pearson and indian scholars including uh, uh, economic historian amiya kumar bagchi k n choudhry and many others have uh, gone in detail and sought to show the importance of india in the indian ocean and i must say one thing here that this is not simply a post facto analysis that people in the 20th century once the western dominance began to be questioned he started saying that india and other asian countries had been important in the indian ocean the fact is that this perception has been there for thousands of years and it is reflected even in the nomenclature why is it that it is called the indian ocean and who is it who called it the indian ocean first it was the arabs who were again a very very important seafaring community who first called it bahre hind that is the waters of india and indian ocean is merely a translation of bahre hind so the recognition that india was at the center of the maritime tradition in the indian ocean and of course other countries including china also participated in it always been there nevertheless as uh, dr amit kumar's uh, uh, title today shows it is such an important subject especially in the context of the present the history of the last 75 years when the indian ocean has uh, witnessed several phases phases so uh, of course we had uh, uh, the period uh, of the second world war there when there was collaboration between the allied powers and then the period of cold war when there was a competition in the indian ocean uh, between the two rivals so i wouldn't say it was much of a competition because soviet union was never a serious naval power so it was all the way a domination by us and europe for uh, the period from say 1945 to 1990 or so and then of course in the last 30 years or uh, we can say that it has been more or less in terms of uh, naval power it has been an era of uh, us power in the indian ocean which as dr amit i believe is going to argue is now in a way uh, if not coming to an end it is surely being threatened by the rise of the chinese power i believe that in this uh, lecture he is uh, going to focus more on the 
historical tradition but i do hope that he will speak about the present as well which is what uh, the title of his topic suggests i uh, must say that uh, the topic is important not simply because uh, of theory but because of the practical aspects of uh, the contest in the indian ocean because uh, this is the most populous part of the world and uh, we can say that roughly uh, uh, 60% of the population of the world lives in this region and whatever happens here therefore has uh, implications not only for these people but for the rest of the world as well therefore uh, geopolitical arrangements or balance of power in this region assumes uh, uh, importance uh, beyond uh, the region also with these few words i would now like to once again welcome dr amit kumar and uh, request him to proceed uh, with his lecture please switch on the mic yeah Uh, my presentation is divided into two parts. First is maritime tradition in the ancient oh, no, past. No, Second, India. I will focus more on India, India maritime tradition in the ancient past. India's maritime tradition in the ancient past. From the great so Considering the geographic formation of India, long east and west coast, and maritime history, is very big and varied. In the analysis of analysis of the ancient past, I'm talking about ancient past. It needed to clarify the existing dilemma of whether India had seafarer tradition or not. India's maritime literature, literature furnishes evidence with numerous references to sea voyages and seaborne trade, and the constant use of the ocean as a great highway of cultural intercourse and international commerce. Then where is the problem? Indian maritime history, particularly Indian ancient maritime history as such, has not been well documented. And whatever little maritime history we know or study are largely written by and recorded by Western historians. This is the basic problem here. And second, why is it important from defense, security, and foreign policy perspective or international relations perspective? Because it is imperative to explain what kind of maritime capabilities the nation need. It will also help to formulate our naval diplomacy strategy as well as trade policy, international trade policy. Can say. Chair uh, Lansen, the name of Jim Paniker, a career diplomat and historian, in his book, India and the Indian Ocean, clearly asserts that there has been that quote, there has been an unfortunate tendency to overlook the sea in the discussion of India's defense problem. The security of India is a matter of exclusively of the Northwest frontier. And of a strong enough army to resist any aggression across the Hindu coast. This is entirely one-sided view of the Indian history. He is talking about sea blindness. Now I will start with the Indus Valley civilization, maritime aspects. What was the common perception earlier? Indus Valley civilization was continental in composition. This is old perception and common also. And uh, trade with contemporary civilization of West Asia, contemporary civilization of West Asia, you can say Gulf region, Sumer, Mesopotamia, was over terrestrial routes. This is a common myth. Some archaeological excavations during 1950s, late 1950s and early 1960s, they built a coastal element or maritime element in the Indus Valley civilization, Indus Valley trade with West Asia. The excavation at Lothal was a landmark in the India's maritime history. A, we got many evidence that proved that fish had maritime connect with West Asia. 
Uh, this was the paradigm shift in the existing historical perception. I will start with the Luther dog cat. This is the picture of Lothal dockyard. Size does matter here. Actually, measurement of the ward yard is 710 feet long, about 120 feet wide. This entail robust maritime activities at Lothal. And dock for this is this shows that dock was for large size sea going vessel or as a boat pin for a number of small craft. In this regard, noted archaeologist Esha Rao, who was the head of that excavation, intimate uh, writes Lothal had developed overseas, quote, Lothal had developed with the west coast of India on the one hand and the Mesopotamian cities to the Bahrain Island on the other. Unquote. Archaeologists also believe that the Lothal dockyard equipped to birth and service ships is the first and the earliest known dock in the world. Lothal was also a warehouse of the rice cutting and wheat grown in the hinterland. It is now believed that the Indus people exported agriculture and marine products and it in return imported raw materials such as gemstones as well as metals needed for domestic consumption and processing industry. Other evidence from the excavation of Rappan coastal sites, the finding of large Rappan copper fish soup in a book in a very good state of preservation at Padri. Padri is just uh, near Bhavanagar, just one kilometer from Bhavanagar. Reflects the Harappan master in the deep sea fishing, use of large boats. And uh, Chuhu, Daro and Lothar were two important centers of bead making. Imported agate and carnelian for producing beads on a large scale. That center, Chuhu, Chuhu Daro and Lothal, they imported agate and carnelian. Bunset, there's another evidence. Bunset ingots of matching design and structure have been found at Rathal, Kuala, and Persian Gulf Islands. That is, that there is resemblance of that Bunset uh, found at Lothal and surrounding and at the Persian Gulf. One seal portrait and anchor. It suggests wide usage of advanced marine equipment and an extensive use of seagoing deep water craft. Here, one of the seals bears the impression of swastik drawn in multiple lines, similar to the seals from Susa, Barak, and Siak. These are in these center are in Gulf region. Indian maritime connects with contemporary civilization that that connects India's maritime trade, maritime cultural interest, maritime culture. That time culture was not dominant, but trade was there. That not is that was not established, but little bit trade was with Harappan civilization with West Asia. A large school of sail, there is found of uh, finding of large school of sail working in mature Harappan, the marine sail ornaments popular in Harappan people. This is the carnelian and agate feet. I uh, got this picture from Lothal Museum, Lothal. Now we'll talk about Harappan's, Harappa's maritime trade network. An extensive trade network existed between the Harappa and Mesopotamian civilization from as early as the middle Harappan phase, with much commerce being handled by middleman merchants from Dilman. Dilman is near Bahrain. This is called modern Bahrain. Now. And Falk, Bah this is near Bahrain and Falka located, Falakka, located in the Persian Gulf. Such long distance sea trade became feasible with the innovative development of tank built watercraft 
equipped with a single central mast supporting a silo of woven rushes or cloth. The pottery, seals, and trinkets of Sumerian origin found at Harappa, Mohenjadro, Chahudaro, and Lothal, and the Indus seals, beads, and wave weights found in the Sumerian cities in the third and second millennium BC. These are indicative of extensive maritime commerce and a robust trade relations between the trading centers of two civilizations. The recent discovery of a Persian Gulf seal at Lothal and similar finding of several seals bearing the Indus motifs and a script in Bahrain and Falca says that the Persian Gulf region was an active participant in the Indo-Sumerian trade. In the light of this, new evidence a review of commercial and cultural contact between the two civilizations becomes necessary this is the illustration of ancient civilization during second and third millennium bc uh, this is the industrialization in greek uh, brown color that's sumer and after that the um, persian gulf region sumer and mesopotamia mesopotamia is not seen in this picture And this is the trade route, land route as well as sea route. Dilman, Bahrain, that that I mentioned, Bahrain and Gulf region, and Urupur are in Sumatra. Lothal. Ancient text and maritime connects. Sumeria, I'm talking about Sumerian and Akkadian text. In addition, as communications of some kind maintained with the inhabitants of three lands, Dilman, Dilman was shown in picture, Dilman, Magan, and Meluha. Uh, that communication was by sea. There are enough evidence to prove that uh, the communication between these were by sea. Several references of boats from these lights coming to Ur, Lagas, and Akkad. In addition to archaeological evidence, numerous Sumerian card texts reveal the communication of some kind were maintained with the inhabitants of three lands. I talked, uh, I repeat, uh, uh, Dilman. Dilman was a very active trade center, Megan and Meluva. And Dilman was probably associated with, associated with the ancient sites on the island of Bahrain in the Persian Gulf. I saw that in the Bronze Age, because of its location along the sea trade routes linking Mesopotamia with the Indus Valley civilization, Dilman developed into one of the greatest interports of trade of the ancient world. Dilman was a trade distribution center of goods originating in the island of Bahrain, eastern province, Saudi Arabia. Oman or the Iranian coast in the Persian Gulf. The Sumerian localization of Magan was probably Oman. Historian Limans, uh, who carried out an extensive study of this region, wrote about the ex existence of Mesopotamia's Meluha trade network. His interpretation was based on information gathered from the Meluha text. The texts are available to establish the fact that there was direct trade between the Indus and the Meluha during the Akkad and Gurdia period. That time, boats come from Meluha to Sumer and Akkad. There are there are mention of both. Lemans was identified three primary region, regions to establish the maritime linkage between the Indus and Meluha. First, the accessible distance between the Indus Delta and Oman. Second, the trade connectivity between Mesopotamia and Meluha through the sea routes is uh, well supported by archaeological facts. And third, the presence of adequate evidence in the form of ports and the developments in boat building in the Indus region also support the assumption.
a local and inner sea, heat and wind from Sumeria region. This also then reflects maritime trade between Lothar and Sumeria region. Persia Gulf seal at Lothar and finding of Semrad seals being the Indus motifs and a script in Bahrain Falaka, and Falaka. There were trade links between Sumer, Persian, Persian Gulf region, and Indus region. Uh, some text from Bahrain National Museum. Uh, reflects that the decline of Yudas matched with the collapse of the Indus Valley civilization. There are many evidence that seals, geometric designs, poetry and paintings that shows maritime connects of Western West Asia with the uh, Indus region. Among the mechanism of Indus maritime trade is by the former. In fact, seals and sealing evidence prove definite indication of trade between Indus and Sumer. Persian Gulf types of seal at Lothal, India and the Phylaka. Corroboration of the long distance sea trade among Indus Gulf and Mesopotamia trade centers. Occurrence of circular seals bearing the Indus script and the motif in the Persian Gulf, and cylinder seals bearing a similar motif and a script in the Sumer and Akkadian region. Archaeologists believe that few barrels of weight found local must have been imported from imported from Mesopotamia or Persian Gulf region. And the cubical waves of the Indus type found that Susa, Kis, and Barak, these are in Gulf region, must have been traveled from the Harappa region. Conical weights with or without blind holes were not common in the Indus Valley, and the presence of Lothal in Mohenjo-daro suggests that that these conical weight must have come from Mesopotamia. Mesopotamia. Like poetry, painting is another indicator of maritime trade and cultural linkages between the Lothal and West Asia. The close similarity between the theme of provincial style paintings found at Lothal and some paintings noticed in the West Asia is remarkable. Furthermore, most significantly, Lothal paintings are dissimilar to local Harappan paintings. Such dissimilarity clearly put forward the idea of maritime connection between Lothal and Mesopotamia and its role in cultural assimilation between the two old civilizations. This is Pons provincial style paintings on the Lothal. Uh, now I'm talking about sea, boat, and maritime trade. These are the evidence, sea, boat, what this is. There are many references of reed boats, raw boats, and sailing boats. Terracotta models of sailing boats and two models of sailing ships have been found at Lothal and Mesopotamia. Amitji, just a request because now only 10 minutes are left, so probably you can move on from Harappa to to other uh, okay. civilizations. Ten. If at all you want okay. to cover them, or no, unless no. you are focusing on no. Harappa only, then it's okay. Okay. Various archaeology reports from the Gulf region support the hypothesis that traders of Harappa were used to fly their boats of Oman, UA, and Bahrain. There is question whether sailors are Technique to sail in contrary condition, opposite direction of monsoon or not. This is the representation of a boat on a shield. Now I'm moving to a very period. But before that, I would like to say that is important because that uh, so I'm covering whether the sailors had technique to sail in contemporary condition of the direction of monsoon or not. 
the sailor of this region had to contend with the monsoon wind in arabian sea and seamal seamal was local wind in the gulf region as well as the land breezes along the coastal routes as there is no evidence of latin seals in the third and second millennium bc it can be assumed with a reasonable assurance at its juncture that the boats could only sail be along the direction of prevailing winds and perhaps the knowledge of seasonal direction was used for advanced planning of long sea voyages finally it can be said the occurrence of hapa poetry seal switch and terracotta objects always a lapis largely and gold at quill and harappan territories indicate the existence of overland route between sind and the ports of makara by the nomadic and transhuman pattern of subsistence although missing chain of trade exchange does raise some doubts over regular commerce between these ancient civilization there are however several technology evidence and textual reference which strongly support the overseas trade between the two ancient civilization the vedic period i am going to discuss the vedic period maritime dimension after in this vedic civilization for about 6 Hundred years, there is no enough archaeological literary literary evidence of seafaring activity by Indians. And this, uh, before going to literary evidence, I will just uh, mentioning some excavation at Dwari about uh, mainly excavation Dwarika. I am not mentioning anything on regarding Beth Dwarika. In 1979-80, excavation at Dwarka cast off the doubts expressed by historians about the historicity of Mahabharata and the very existence of Dwarka city as well as seafaring activities in Vedic India. Discovery of large stone anchors of different types of size, types and size, from the exploration of submerged city of Dwarka supports its maritime linkages with some region of outer world. This is what. what literally evidence vedic literature suggest indian indians built ships navigated the sea and monopolized international trade both by sea and the land routes the vedas puranas replete with reference of boat ship sea voyages and sea bond trade veda contains more than 100 references to ocean ocean means samudra according to in one in interpretation many doesn't believe in this interpretation dozen of references to seas and to rivers flowing to the into the sea there is mention of vedic god varuna in the rigveda it's clearly written merchant ships were plying to foreign countries in quest of more wealth and the voyages were taken out for profit and rigveda is supposed to never like tradition of on which sugra the rishi king sent to his son bhushya against some of his enemy in the distant islands many scholars believe that vedic panish who constituted the merchant class were associated with the bakanalas probably devolians devolinians in their commercial activities some historians also use the that phoenicians phoenicians and sin navigators were of indian origin and they were panish of the vedic india Rigveda has also have also a description of vessel called Palava that was large large boat and boats are also mentioned in Ayurveda. Shamita there are many references of sea and boat in many Shamitas. Ramayana there are references of uh, Yavana Deep, Shwarna Deep in Ramayana. Chetu Samudram you know. Uh, if there are there is reference of merchants who trafficked trafficked beyond the sea and where the habit of bringing presents to the king that puranas has many references of sea ocean sea voyages now how much time five more minutes Greek and Roman literary record. I'm talking about Nanda and Maurya period. Maritime connects. There are Greek and Roman literary records of Alexander's India campaign, Jaska, and the contemporary events provide ample evidence of maritime interaction and oceanic enterprises. Deep building industry was flourishing in the Mauryan period. 
demand from the ocean trade were the reason behind the growth of the Indian seed building industry. There are many evidences in uh, Greek literature. Eratosthenes was aware of the geography of India, mouth of Ganges. Uh, Megasthenes also wrote about the sea building industry in the Mauryan period. There was mention of silk trade between China, Birch, and Bactria route. There is mention of South West, West Monsoon and mention of Tramlipti port also. Cotillia Arsa's writing of Megasthenes talk about shipping during more a period. There was mention of board of shipping. Uh, Naudetcha. Naudetcha was the head of the superintendent of the shipping department. Asoka Maritime Connects. So the 13 rock addicts says many things about uh, Ashoka, yeah, and you can say India, Roman connect during the Ashoka period. And uh, there are mention of voyages to Ceylon, Burma, and Southeast Asia. Jataka story also tell about sea voyages. During Satwana and the Kushana period, there was extensive cultural and economic contacts with Greeks. Satwana trade was not restricted to within India and they had trade relations with far off foreign land. Seaborne trade and the Satwana is its genesis. Writing of Periplus of region, she told me geography and Venice natural history provide much evidence regarding the Indo Roman trade. Knowledge of the southwest monsoon provided a new impetus for the maritime trade in the region. Now traders were able to plan their voyages according to the prevailing winds during uh, Kushana and Satwana period. I'm talking. Considering the turbulent nature of the southwest monsoon, Egyptian Roman traders were using the big and steady ships, had very strong hulls, and for the purpose of the security, it was fitted with conservative rig. Should I go? Uh, you can take two, two okay. more minutes. Now I'm briefly outlining the India's Indian Ocean strategy during the Cold period, Cold War period and post-Cold War period. During the Cold War period, for almost 2,000 years, the British exercised military dominance. And in the late 1960s, British withdrew a military facility from the east of Swaz, east of Swage, or you can say Indian Ocean region was the domestic pressure, economic problem in the Britain. France also set down its military bases, but uh, they operated from La, La Reunion and to Maito. France retained commanding operation at Cape of Good Hope. She wrote in the early 1970s, US and so first US, then Soviet came to uh, fill the power vacuum. I would suggest that since we are focused on ancient period, you better leave this out and conclude whatever you want to say about the ancient period. Okay. Because otherwise uh, it will take more time. Okay. Right? Finally, I, I would like to say that uh, there are many evidence, literally and archaeological evidence, to prove that India had robust maritime tradition in the ancient past. But that is not well documented. There are some ambiguities, so we need to research more on that thing and should go for logical conclusion. And uh, we have to, I'm not saying discard the old view, but we should go logically to debate on that issue and we should come with new development, new idea subject thank you um we are open to questions now just just a moment i think we have a question from mr gautam saying there ah we'll come to her later mr gautam saying do you want to ask a question yes i do have i do want to ask a question go ahead 
uh, you see this has been a very nice lecture linking the past uh, but as uh, the coordinator was mentioning, we would like to hear a little bit on the present strategic concept, uh, strategic developments, how it impinges uh, this, you know, this squad. And then recently we have had the economic framework, uh, I mean, a dialogue started. So how would it really play out? The historical context seems to be receding into the background and more it is the present question of survival and uh, ensuring uh, the flow of resources required for nation building and national protection that is playing out. We would like to have the considered views of the author on this. Thank you. Okay. Another question, same please question. use the mic. Same question, same question. In fact, I was also going to ask the same question about the current happenings. Please use the mic because without mic, people cannot hear. I, I looked at that, uh, the, your title also, India's uh, Indian Ocean study. So I was thinking about that. You are going to discuss something about the current happenings. This is my book project. My background chapter are on, uh, are on ancient past, maritime ancient past. Maritime so you are not looking at the current. No, I'm looking current, but I I start with maritime past. He says he will come to that part It's okay. Historical historical developments and historical past to the present. If you have any question regarding the current scenario. His question is the same. Minakshi ji, any question? His question is also the same. Ah. He's also the same question. Minakshi ji. Actually, my question is of the past. Uh, you know, you talked about references to the Vedas, in the Vedas to Samudra, ships and all that. But many historians say that the Indus Valley and the Vedic period are actually one. So that is something, you know, because you have marked the Vedic period as a separate period. Uh, but I think that you need to take, uh, because there is no archaeological evidence of a Vedic period. Vedic period only exists in the text. So now most historians, they combine the two. You know, like B.B. Lal and all, they say that the Vedic period is actually the Indus period. Yeah, maybe. We have a question from Ridhi also. Please use the mic. Thank you for your talk. Uh, you've provided a lot of material evidence of this maritime trade and contact. As an anthropologist, I would like to hear if there is any cultural evidence of the same, you know, uh, diasporic communities, for instance, cultural practices uh, that are specific, that specifically speak to this uh, coming together as a point of cultural contact, as markets and trade often are. Thank you. Yeah. Actually, I talked about uh -huh. Maritime okay. ancient past, ancient past that cover Indus Valley series and Vedic period and Maurya period. There are some cultural contexts during the Mauryan periods and Satwana and Kusana periods that even discussed here. But they, I didn't find any cultural contexts during the Indus time period and Vedic period. I didn't get anything. I don't know where it was. Other questions? Would you like to say anything? Okay. We have another question from Nandini Bhattacharya Panda there. Please go ahead. Yes, I have a different, I have a few different questions. One is, um, you, you, and this is quite a interesting presentation, although it's the time is huge and the, and the expanse is huge. But I just want to know one thing, that is the sea route that had been used by the traders from, um, from outside and from India. Um, how the sea route has changed? Because the ecology has changed. Like I have seen, um, you have just briefly mentioned about Tamralipto. Tamralipto was is considered to be a great port and actually in Tomluk there is a museum um, and that museum contains uh, many artifacts from Mesopotamia and Assyrian civilization and Egyptian civilization which indicate the trading activities. Um, but there is no ocean in Tamrulipto now. So I am sure the, the route that had been uh, followed by the traders had been changed. Is there any study about it? And secondly, 
um, that sea route, maritime trade, trade is just one activity. There are, I mean, other other objectives as well for sea voyages, like like Mohindra, uh, like Ashoka's, you know, emissaries went to Ceylon, Mohindra and Shangamitra for spreading uh, Buddhism, and there are many other you know what we can call soft power um, do you have any interest in these subjects and finally i just want to ask that um, how one can connect the maritime trade and the sea route um, and the potential of the uh, potential of the trading activities in the past and how one can connect with the present in terms of potentials and and activities like trading and other activities thank you actually about tram lipti tram lipti was a trading uh, port and that was transit port during uh, maurya period kushana shatwana period between uh, bactria tram lipti and china that was transit port and there was trade between Tramlipti and Shilon and Tramlipti and Southeast Asia, Swarnabhumi and all. And it, there is theory of shifting sold, uh, sea coast also. That is very logical. And regarding the Lothal, I would like to mention Lothal was at, I think, about many kilometers away from the sea coast now. But it was the sea coast. And uh, to support this hypothesis, there is shifting sword line theory, and that is very much very scientific. So we cannot deny that Lothal was not mm -hmm. at coast or Tramlipti was not at coast. And second, uh, you talked about maritime trade, what we learn, how it is important. So we always learn from history how we are trading with the outer world indian ocean region and other mm -hmm. uh, region so somehow we get how can we maximize our trade potential in current period any questions from there uh i see uh mr gautam sain is again raising his hand please go ahead uh, no, sorry, I don't have any question now. Thank you. All right, all right. I I thought that there was a. If you want up, to current, I can explain. No, no, no. That's okay. Something about the current Okay. I don't have the title. This is the Indian Indian Ocean Center. So I was thinking that you are going to return the current. You know, okay, uh, Ramesh, his is a case of somebody who has made an effort yeah. to yes. come this afternoon when he, he could have taken a nap, perhaps of uh, you know listening to it so what he's saying is I, I that because the title is india's ocean children. strategy yeah, yeah, yeah. so if you can connect yeah. the ancient past with india's current ocean strategy i think yeah, yeah, he will feel rewarded isn't it yeah, <laughs> and, and, and that is the yes. actually i will start there was power anyway, I think it's been very useful, yeah whatever the past year yes yes there was superpower rivalry in the Cold War region. After the Cold War region, a uh, Cold War period, in post Cold War period, US remained the sole superpower. After withdraw, after distinguishing of the Soviet Union, and uh, after some time, there was rising some rising powers who came in picture that Japan, China, India. Again, after that, I we can say after 2000, China assertively came in picture, and there was India-China rivalry, U.S.-China rivalry, not exactly U.S.-China rivalry, but there was U.S.-India maritime cooperation, us on india side. There was rivalry between India and China. And West was an Indian. Again, 
problem with India was the how can we manage, we can balance China. We are working on that. One major change what happened, India started to engage. Earlier, India followed the policy of military isolation in Cold War period. India started to engage that period. India started to engage with great power uh, and uh, small literal states. There was perception of that in this region, in Indian Ocean region, among the island states, that India is hegemon power. That perception started to change in post Cold War period. It became possible with the help of engagement. I'm not talking only military engagement, economic engagement also. Earlier, India followed the policy of uh, in, actually economy was inward looking in Cold War. <clears throat> After liberalization, India wanted uh, India started to engage the small and big parts, island states. So things start become started to change. After that, capability India is working on capability front also, but there is huge gap in capability. Chinese capability and Chinese naval capability and Indian naval capability. See the number of uh, submarines. India is India has about 15 submarines and China has more than 60. And there is great plan to enhance the number in coming 20, 30 years. Aircraft carriers, India, at least India needs three aircraft carriers. Two operational one for because aircraft carrier takes uh, much time in repairing and fitting so it's one spare aircraft is needed one for bay of Bengal, one for arabian this is the thing we have quad we are cooperating with great powers quad we are getting great benefit from quads we, this is not military uh, platform we are not engaging militarily but we are engaging on the traditional front. This is winning the heart of small island states, the small states. Uh, this will pay in Indian Ocean. Region. I think there is a question from uh, Mr. Naveen Kumar there. Please go ahead. Hello, sir. Yes. Am I audible? Yes, very much. Oh, okay, okay. Thank you so much, sir. A, a wonderful presentation by Amit Kumar, sir. Sir, myself, Naveen Kumar, I am from uh, Chaudhary Bansilal University, Bhivani, Haryana. So, sir, I just want to understand from, from you one very basic point regarding India's and India's Indian Ocean strategy. We had uh, writings of uh, like Sardar K. M. Panikar in uh, mid-1940s when he published his uh, India and Indian Ocean. So, just I just want to ask your, yourself mentioned your presentation about historical past, uh, historical legacies, civilization. Uh, so I just want to understand ki why India did not pay much attention on its maritime frontiers or maritime boundaries or Indian Ocean particular. Thank you. Actually, thank you. India is obsessed with land frontiers, Western, not Western region. You can ask to. We are paying for that sea plan. There is simple. Thing. There was Pakistan, China. We are engaged more in Pakistan and China. I think uh, the questions on that front have been exhausted. I had a few questions and comments of my own, which I would like to bring to your attention. Uh, one, of course, uh, unfortunately, uh, there is a kind of slight mismatch between the title of the talk and of course the content though i understand that given the nature of your book project obviously you are going to divide it into two in the first part you are going to talk about the past and no, then no, i would like to mention here only somebody told from this office that you have submitted chapter on history so you have to present in this all right you have to mention all these things so yes i consider but in that case probably the title should have been different I, India's maritime past or something like that. Anyway, that's done now. So this is one. Second is, you see, uh, uh, the question that Mr. Gautam Sen has asked and the question that uh, has been asked by Sir here, uh, you see this uh, 
it's one thing to you have given all the details about uh, and uh, about the harappan civilization and then about the vedic period about uh, india's maritime tradition and those facts are broadly correct all and they are well accepted uh, two things uh, emerge out of this one is that uh, you know i do not think that this assumption is correct that these things are not known or they have not been documented because you said somewhere that they have not been documented not well documented yeah well documented i would say that they have been well documented for decades now but i understand your point that as a scholar of international relations you want to look into these things and want to connect them with the present strategy in the indian ocean that in itself is a valuable and uh, worthwhile exercise where as i said you know uh, because most of this work has been done by historians and not by the practitioners or writers of ir so unfortunately this impression has been created that india's ancient or medieval maritime tradition has not been well documented in fact rc majumdar was writing about all these things 70 80 years ago and uh, you know they have talked about uh, not just rc majumdar but many others about the great uh, rk mukherjee ha huh, rk mukherjee and so many other people and i told you that you know then have so many other names in the post independence period also of the people who have talked about ratnam arsharatnam yes. Yes. Asin Das Gupta, so many other I, I, I already took all those names. See, the point is this: you know, your exercise is valuable in the sense that within an IR framework, you are looking at the ancient past and you are trying to connect them and you are trying to draw lessons from the past, which is a very good and worthwhile exercise. But I think you know it is advisable to sort of keep this in mind. that uh, as far as historians are concerned they have already done a lot of work on india's maritime tradition india's naval tradition india's trade and commerce with the rest of the world and the facts that have been uh, highlighted uh, by you here you see uh, one uh, problem that arises in all this is uh, you give the example of dwarka and you say that uh, excavations of dwarka have in some way confirmed the historicity of the mahabharat uh, i doubt that that is what these excavations do meenakshi ji is here uh, she is from ancient uh, history i'm yeah, sure i just will... want to make a uh, point over here that historians have said that what has been found at dwarka is actually much later which drifted with the sea so they say it's probably medieval period the yes. findings are not of the mahabharat period at all yes and the other thing that i must uh, point out uh, amit ji is this that in literary texts what often happens is that the original version is revised time and over again and many other references of the later period when the material civilization had changed fundamentally either in terms of its output or in terms of its location those are added and therefore what happens is that a literary text or a historical text which is hundreds or thousands of years old has to be read with great care and it requires a lot of verification from other types of evidence before we can come to any conclusion about what it uh, confirms or does not confirm now yours is a laudable uh, effort to look into history and connect it with ir so i'm just uh, you know uh, putting this as as a piece of advice to you Uh, about how to uh, go about this uh, then you see uh, um yeah again you gave the example of you know what the what the periplus of the arithian sea says in the first century ad pliny the elder and uh, all these other people in fact the romans and the greeks have mapped uh, their relations maritime relations and land relations with india far more than we have done it and it has been there uh literally for uh, for uh, for thousands of years actually uh, i would say it's very very well documented in fact we have discovered them only in the recent past in the last 200 years after uh, this uh, the rise of the orientalist movement because obviously we had we did not have a connect with all this knowledge so you see it has to be seen in that uh, context another thing that i would like to uh, bring uh, to your consideration is this uh you see 
in some sense and i think this is to you as a scholar of ir because i think your purpose ultimately was to draw some practical sort of you know lessons out of india's maritime past now the conditions as i think uh, gautam sain also said have changed fundamentally in so many ways now we are facing a totally different world one the world has been integrated now the ancient world yes it had deep interconnections but despite those interconnections it was not uh, anywhere as integrated a world to as we know compared to uh, india many other countries they have a huge lead when it comes to naval power you rightly said that now you also correctly said that india has been obsessed with land borders isn't it now india has been obsessed with land borders because of two reasons one of course uh, is geography itself in fact it is not just india is it a coincidence let me uh, you know <laughs> say this here is it a coincidence that it is a small island england which became uh, the dominant naval power of the world from the 18th century see it was such a small country 500 years ago england had a population of just 5 million by the way even during the reign of uh, the first queen elizabeth its population was hardly 6 7 million so a small island in fact which had no other advantage it was a small it was very very cold its climate uh, could not support uh, rich agriculture it did not produce anything worthwhile which it could sell in india or any other part of the world why is it this question needs to be asked why is it that such a small country was able to sort of uh, develop itself gradually dominate the oceans of the world create a world empire rule one fourth of the world have industrial revolution and so many other things so on the face of it what looks like a disadvantage of being very small marginal and geographically isolated also became its great uh, advantage and why did it become an advantage will be clear that to us if we compare not india and england because that comparison is too far fetched but england and france and there we see that france was the most powerful the most important continental power in europe and france had the same dilemma as you rightly said as larger countries like india faced india china ottoman empire persian empire all of them faced this dilemma on what to do with the naval power because the principal challenges military challenges to all these great continental powers came from land until a few centuries ago and not from the ocean therefore now if we today argue that say akbar or aurangzeb committed a mistake in not building a great navy i think we are using the benefit of hindsight uh, in a sort of uh, in a wrong way because their challenges were continental it was natural and rational for them to think of building continental power which was useful for them it at that time defensive approach pardon it may be defensive no not defensive because what happens is that and I, this is a point about history see in every age people behave according to their rationality rationality will be defined as i would say according to their current needs i will agree with you that they were probably not far sighted enough aurangzeb for instance let me tell you one thing aurangzeb uh, was informed about england uh, you know and uh, of course uh, sir josia choi child was there he had revolted against aurangzeb and he was told about the queen and king of england and the size of the island etc so he simply dismissed it he said it's some small uh, you know kingdom somewhere and of no uh, importance to us now today we can look back and say well orange was not far sighted and maybe he wasn't but my point is you know if you put yourself in 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 the 1660s or 1670s when europe is nowhere actually compared to the large continental powers of asia obviously it will be you will have to be a genius to be able to see that 200 years ago or 150 years ago these people will become the dominant naval power and then they will become the dominant land power etc etc so these uh, complications about uh, you know about uh, naval versus continental power 
also have to be kept in mind uh, while you sort of proceed with your study i agree with your point that uh, you know uh, we have been obsessed with continental power uh, in the uh, recent past we have been obsessed because we have faced two enemies uh, on the continental side the fact is that uh, after independence we have not faced a naval threat because naval threat is coming only now but even now of course it is uh, more of a continental threat okay. which we are facing on the so i agree with you that we need to build our naval power it's very very important but uh, this is a partial uh, sort of answer and some piece of advice also for your further research obviously thank you anything else okay uh, thank you very much i take this opportunity to thank all the participants and also thank dr amit kumar for his very comprehensive and insightful uh, lecture on the subject We'll continue the discussion over tea.